Hey, welcome to Storytime with Ellie Podcast, and I have the pleasure of interviewing a remarkable woman who hosts her own podcast and has faced numerous challenges in her life, including battling deep depression, struggling with morbid obesity, and enduring a toxic marriage. Despite these hardships, she is a mother of three and has overcome homelessness. Her journey has shaped her into a strong, resilient warrior with unwavering mindset. And let's welcome Mindy Lyons. Come on in, Mindy. How are you? Thank you so much, Ellie. I'm doing fantastic. How about you? I am doing great. Glad to have you on here today and um, can't wait to hear your story. Thank you. I'm excited to share. Yeah, great, great, great. Um, so let's just start with a little bit about Mindy, a little bit about, um, I mentioned your podcast host, but let's just go a little bit beyond that, right? Let's go a little bit on uh, what shaped you into say, okay, I want to get out there and be a podcast host and talk about my journey. And um, that's a great question. Um, I don't really say that the podcast hosting thing is my primary thing. I, I recorded a few episodes and so I'm very new to it, but really, I guess it comes down to this quote that I heard once and I don't even know who the original person is, but the quote was that your story can be the key that unlocks someone else's prison. Yeah. So I've accumulated just like most of us, an incredible amount of experience. I feel like a cat in many respects, like I've had nine lives worth of experience and so there's a lot of trauma and drama in my history that I've learned so many valuable lessons from, and that has also shaped who I am as a person. And I've developed so many iterations of myself, you know, from that person who was very broken and very wounded and insecure and, you know, extremely low self-value to someone today who has a very high amount of confidence. I mean, I'm by no means perfect at all, but I am completely contrast version of myself and who I used to be. And a lot of people have continuously asked me, how have you done that? How have you changed your life? Not only circumstantially on the exterior, but that complete transformation starting from the from the inside out. And so, you know, it's kind of one of those things where I felt this nudge that I really need to be getting out there, putting my story out there. People have been asking me so many times, you know, write books, get do blogs and um, have your own podcast. You should have your own show and all of those things. But I'm a big person about timing and things lining up the way that they're meant to in the best way possible. And I think that over the years, you know, I've just been refining myself and um, becoming an even, even more evolved person of myself. And now I'm at the place where I feel that it is time to really start sharing many of those things. And the podcast is, is just one part of it. Um, I do a lot of my sharing on my social media pages. I'm very transparent and very open about my life. Um, but now I'm venturing into other platforms just to be able to reach even more people with my story. Beautifully, really beautifully said. And I think, um, oh, as we all find, is that um, podcast is is a to be a podcast host is a great niche for that because it helps sure. bring out stories with other people. And it's you're getting across a wide range more than just you know talking about it with some friends or and people that know you right that know what you've been through. They see it, but to get your story out and to inspire others, and I think that's why most of us. So I'm saying you and I, we're, we're more like doing this too, is to help others get their story out so people can understand that they're not alone. And look at, you know, looking at you, you're a beautiful woman, you're smart, you're intelligent, you've been through so much. And now look at you, we can look at you and say, oh my God, look at this woman, she did it, she made it. You're inspirational. And I think that's what um, this yeah. is all, all about. So um, let's, as we move forward, anything else you want to add before I start asking a few little questions about what I pulled up on you? No, go for it. Anything that comes to your mind, I'm I'm open. Okay. I have to write things down, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we had a lot to say. Um, I was like, uh, can you share with us a little bit about what you went through with your, um, went through some depression and uh, you said morbid obesity. Yep. Do you want to share a little bit of that journey with us? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's a lot, you know, I mean, it's a lot to share. Yeah, so it's right. kind that's, of that's hard to know. <laughs> yeah. It's like, which parts do you leave out and which parts do you include? But um, I mean, just to kind of give you cliff notes, I mean, I feel like I have to give a little bit of context because uh, a lot of what I've dealt with stemmed from uh, things that 
developed as a child. So, you know, in my early childhood, that's where we all form a lot of our beliefs about ourselves based off of what we were taught, what our parents or neighbors or, you know, people from school, the peers, we tend to establish our own self-identity and self-worth based on those things. And it was very strongly ingrained in me that I was good for nothing. I would never amount to anything. I was stupid. Uh, I, I was told once that if any guy was ever dumb enough to marry me, that he would guarantee a divorce within five years. Oh. And, you know, I was called fat and ugly and an ugly fat pig and just all kinds of stuff. So, I mean, we've all had things like that, right? But when you're young, you haven't developed the emotional intelligence or the self-awareness to be to even realize that the things that people put on you actually have nothing to do with you. It's very much how they are per perceiving the world and the world around them and, and their own kind of things that they're projecting on you. But we tend to sort of embody those as beliefs about ourselves because uh, especially if it's family members or people who are close to you, we think, well, they, what they are saying must be true. Otherwise they wouldn't be saying it about me. So we kind of learn to self-identify as those things. So I really grew up being very insecure, very naive, um, very much a people pleaser, really wanted people to like me and accept me. I mean, we all do, right? But um, what that what ended up happening with that was that I ended up attracting very uh, toxic relationships. So I got married for the first time when I was 18. You know, I could not wait to get out of the house. I was very miserable in my home life and I really just wanted out. And so the, at the stroke of hitting 18, I moved out. I ended up pregnant shortly thereafter. Um, I had met a guy at church and we got together. And so there was a lot of shame in that too, because I was raised very, very ultra conservative Christian. And so that completely shattered a lot of, you know, people's belief in me, their perception of me. I got a lot of criticism, very much, you know, lack of support. So I had my daughter when I was 19. And then at 21 was the first time that I ended up a single parent. Um, my husband at the time had been put in prison. And so that completely rocked my world, you know, in every way possible, had to move back in with my parents so they could help with taking care of my daughter while I went back to work. And then two and a half years, roughly later, I remarried, figured I had learned a few lessons from being around the block, you know, <laughs> with being a single parent and all of that. And yet, you know, when you don't fully heal the wounds of your past, you end up kind of building the same house with, with different bricks. So I ended up in awesome. another relationship that had many, many toxic things about it. And that's where it's kind of like, you know, which parts do you talk about? Which parts do you leave behind? But, um, Suffice it to say that in that relationship, it was a slow burn. You know, it's kind of like that frog in the water analogy where someone on the external would say, I would never let someone treat me like that, or I, I would never be with someone like that, or that could never happen to me because of X, Y, Z. And I just want to point out that a lot of people who have been in abusive relationships, whether they're, you know, physically, sexually, emotionally, spiritually, financially abusive that can happen to the smartest, most intelligent. 100%. Uh, yeah. But a lot of people think yeah. that, you know, people who end up in these things, it's like, well, they're beyond that somehow because of whatever reason. And I just, I guess I'm saying this to, to both sides. If someone has been judgmental of you and you've been in a toxic, abusive relationship, then I just want to give you a little bit of, of relief to say that, you know, you can be smart, educated, all of those things, and still end up somehow entrapped in one of these situations. And it's not, it's so covert. It's so complex. It's not something that typically starts out that way. It can be an extremely s slow fade, you know, where you don't even realize that certain things are happening. And then, you know, as I look back and as I'm sharing my story, of course, I look back and I'm like, oh my gosh, how, how did this happen? You know, I'm smart. I'm all these things. And, you know, I would never allow myself to be treated this way. And then yet you end up in these circumstances yeah. that in retrospect, you're like, how did this even happen? So I'm saying that for the people who have been in it to say, you know what, give yourself some alone. grace. Yeah. No. And also it's like, you have to forgive yourself or things that you didn't know or things that you didn't realize at the time that you now have the self-awareness and also the the retrospect, the 2020 perspective in hindsight. So because I used to be so frustrated with my past self and really be like, 
hard on her, you know, and say, ah, you were, why did you do this? How did you end up like this? And, and as a mom, a lot of mom guilt. And so I had to, once I realized this, I came sort of like full circle. I was like, oh my gosh, you know what? For one thing, I, how can I hold myself accountable back then for who I am today? Because she didn't have the same, she had to totally different, you know, she didn't have the mentality I have right now. She didn't have the awareness. She didn't have the, the, you know, with the support she had, the circumstances that she had, who she was at the time, you know, the resources she had at the time, I made the best de decisions that I knew how with all of those things at the time. And of course that changes as you change and you evolve, that changes. So you can't hold yourself to the same standard, the past you as the current you. It's just ridiculous to think that. And also the other thing that I wanna say that I feel like a lot of women probably need to hear and that we don't really hear often enough is that, as I mentioned, I used to look back at my my previous self in it, even from a physical standpoint, you know, because I had I was an emotional eater, a stress eater and being in a very, very uh, unhealthy relationship. I gained a lot of weight and I got to almost 300 pounds. It physically hurt to exist. You know, my kids would have to help me sometimes buckle my high heels and things like that because I couldn't reach it. I was out of breath just walking to get the mail out of the mailbox. So, you know, I would look at myself and my past pictures and things like that with almost like disgust, you know, and, and really a lot of frustration. I mean, like, it's interesting how you, how you per perceive yourself as in the third, you, you, you dress yourself as the third person, right? Which mm -hmm. means you evolved. You, you are no longer obviously that person. So it's funny how you look back and it makes a lot of sense how you look back at that person as who you were. Right. And, and what was your pivot in point? And you're going to lead up to that. I can tell in the conversation. What what made yeah. you say enough of that? I just said third person, right? Yeah. What what made you well, say? What made you say? Okay, let me you know leave that person behind because that's going to be a great. I mean, I yeah. Think. Well, I think I love that you brought that up, the third person thing, because yeah. there's there's sort of two aspects to it. The thing that I was going to bring up is that I had once I really realized that it was her, it was that version of myself, that past version of myself that walked me here to who I am today. So I can't have any sort of, of um, regret about her or who she was because it was her showing up the next day and the next day and the next day, even if she was um, not able to see any hope, she felt completely hopeless and helpless, didn't feel like she had any worth, any value to contribute to the to the world. It was her that actually produced me. I don't have this separation because, and that's what I'm trying to point out. We separate, we compartmentalize because it's like we somehow begrudge that past version of us and almost like want to disassociate with that past version because we have so much shame about it, so much guilt about it, or just, you know, it just feels icky. We don't want to identify with that version of us. But I look at myself now in that past way with so much grace and compassion and kindness because I was like, oh my gosh, this person was like at the end of her rope. If I didn't have kids, I truly don't believe that I would be here. I had the suicidal thoughts and all of those things. And so I look at her and I look at pictures sometimes of that old version of myself and I'll, I'll just start like a, an emotional meltdown because I feel so much like, girl, you were so strong. Like you felt like you were so weak, but you were so strong to hang on one more day. And one more day, even oh, though I felt no today, just to get you just where you were today. Today. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So, but to answer sort of like that second part, one of it is having tremendous amount of grace and compassion for that previous version of us and for every version of us, because it, we are evolving humans, at least if you're intentionally doing so. A lot of people don't evolve and that's because, you know, it does take some intention. And that's where I'm going right now is that you know, we all have a story. And of course, over those years, uh, you know, I was married for almost 12 years the second time. The second time I'm going to give the little spoiler alert. I'm dropping right to the to the end of that. And I ended up a single parent overnight again for the second time in 2016 when my ex-husband was put in prison. So here I married two people that ended up being criminals. And so there was a lot. Wow. Of, yes, a lot of, oh my gosh, like what is wrong with you, Mindy? You know, how did this happen? This time it was exponentially worse than the first time. And there was a lot of, you know, I lost people in my life. People put rumors around me and circulated all kinds of untruths, even though I had nothing to do with him or his behavior or whatever was going on. I would completely unbeknownst to me. 
I was still, you know, I, it's kind of like people lump you in because it's like, I was married to that person. Well, your associate, right? The same thing with being around friends. You're guilty yes. for the association. So yes, they're going to judge. Unfortunately, yes. that's the sign. People judged big time. I mean, I did have people who knew me to the core of who I was and I, I'm so grateful for those people, but they're even my best friend, um, you know, one of my sisters, you know, people dropped out of my life and even had spread rumors about me. So I understand what that feels like because a lot of women go through these things where they wonder, you know, what are, how are people going to perceive me and will I lose people in my life and are people going to criticize me? A family could be the worst sometimes. Family could be the worst. You know, and I, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, and I'm not better sometimes than, than a, yes. I don't know. It's sometimes it tends, it tends to do that. So I relate to that. We all do. I mean, there's a quote that says a friend sticks closer than a brother. And, you know, I've definitely found that to be true many times in my case. And I've for sure found that family is not always blood. In fact, sometimes it can be complete strangers that you meet exactly. online. You know, some of the people that I've met online through my social media are some of my closest, most dearest people in my life. So I love that. It's like you're always going to people will come into your life when everybody else fades away. So I never worry about that. And I don't even begrudge anybody who walks out of my life because it, it's, I, I truly believe we're all on our own journey. Some people are there for a season. Some people are there for a lifetime. And, you know, I don't worry about any of that anymore because it, it's just part of the process. It's like we have seasons and some stuff just sheds just like with anything. So um, I always trust that. But anyway, so after the second um, time, you know, it's kind of like there was a lot of self audit of, okay, even though I didn't know that these people would be who they became or who they were, um, what was it about me that was attracting these certain dynamics? And really it boiled down to, well, there were a lot of things, but I would say it really boiled down to the insecurities that I had, you know, the lack of confidence because people who have that specific type of personality, um, you know, narcissistic sociopath, which those terms get thrown out a lot and not necessarily accurately. But um, with those personality types, they tend to hone in on people who are uh, people pleasers, you know, who Absolutely. have a lack of self confidence yeah. and, you know, those types yeah. of things. So, I mean, making that realization and also just me, even though I had had my self esteem very much chipped away. I also just have this internal like refusal to let my circumstances define me. So I had been told my whole life that I was stupid and good for nothing, wouldn't amount to anything. And I just had this internal, like, I am going to prove you wrong. I'm going to come back and buy the whole building. You know, like I did, I was not willing to let this be my story. So I did that self-analysis and I said, so, in okay. other words, so for you, for in other words, so people understand too, probably I'm assuming how you felt with that is that, Sometimes that you get more of a drive when people yes. second guess you, right? And I think we need to know, make note of that. And that's what I say is what you need to feed from. And that's how you grew. That's how I grew. It was mm -hmm. when people said, no, it wasn't going to work. Or when I know people doubted me, it made me fight harder. Am I right? Yeah, and I think that might be for yeah. sure. For sure. Yeah. That's not everybody. That's not everybody. Some but I, I will say that like I believe... <laughs> Yeah. For some people, I feel like that's almost sort of like hardwired into your DNA. It's almost like part of part of just who you are as a person, um, because there's a there's an interesting story that I heard once about twin brothers that were raised by an alcoholic father that was in and out of prison. And one turned out to be extremely successful businessman. The other one was just like his father, an alcoholic in and out of prison. So a reporter interviewed both of them because he was so fascinated about the stark contrast between them and how they ended up turning out, even though they were raised in the exact same environment, same circumstances. And both of them essentially said the same thing, which was with a father like I had, how else could I have turned out? And it, it's that thing. It's like, sometimes it's hardwired in us where, I mean, I'm just stubborn. I'm a going, I'm a go against the grain person. I'm a trailblazer. I'm, I'm a disruptor. I, it's like, if you tell me it can't be done, I'm going to show you, you well, know, that's, but, uh, that's kind of that what I was saying before that. That's how we are. And there's still a lot of people yeah. that are like that, you know, as far as the two brothers, it's kind of a little different, but yes, but most of but, us, but anyway. even if you're not hardwired that way, yeah. what I want to point out is that it can absolutely be a choice, mm -hmm. even if yes. it doesn't feel authentic to you to be like that. And you don't feel this fire in your belly when someone tells you that it can't be done. Even if you don't feel that you, you do get to choose 
to do something different and you get to choose how you interpret what's happened to you. You don't always get to choose what happens to you, but you get to choose how you interpret it. So that's where that, that sort of next phase that you were asking me about came from was, okay, I'm looking at this analysis of my life and all I can see is a trail of tremendous failures and mistakes. And so I was like, this is not how I want my story to end. I don't want to be stuck in this victim mode, you know, and I want it to be something that can be empowering, not only to myself, but to other people, because even then I understood the value that our experiences are not only for us, our experiences are for the benefit of other people. So I intentionally started to focus very strongly on my own personal development, on my own mindset and shifting my mindset, changing the way that I talked to myself changing how I perceived the failures of my life. Because what I realized is that when you start looking into all of these people, people who are, are in our history books, people who have, you know, had legacies, they are all people almost without exception who had extremely rough upbringings or life circumstances. And it's like, those are the people who have been the inventors and the world changers and the thought leaders and all of these people that we read about and it was the, the path of long failures and piles and piles of mistakes that they use that to then create this in amazing, incredible life and story. And there's no reason why any of us can't choose to have that happen to us. You know, we, we do get to be the ones that are set apart for those types of things. And it comes down to a choice. So I really developed um, a strong mentality around seeing my failures as stepping stones, as very much a good thing seeing the things about my past that I was ashamed about it's like no those are actually tools that I have in my toolbox to be able to use to relate to other people and to be able to help inspire and support other people so in reframing that I anything that comes at me now I see it as okay bring it you know like I I feel like I have a level of almost invincibility in terms of I've been through so much and I've been able to rise above and overcome so much that there really isn't it's like whatever comes my way, I just have this trust and this knowing that somehow, however painful it is and dark and difficult it might be, I'm going to use that for something really, really good. Like nothing can come at me that I'm not going to somehow make into something good. And that doesn't mean it's just this like um, naive positivity. It's a choice. Right. Right. I got you. I got you. So you take <laughs> that choice. <laughs> yes. And, uh, I'm going to move on also, beautifully said, um, some of the things you have pointed out to me. One of them, again, if you don't feel comfortable talking about it, I know you wrote this in the bio, you can, it's up to you, but I'm sure you're going to talk about it. <laughs> 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 about it. <laughs> um, you had mentioned, and how did you become homeless? So... I think I mentioned that my second husband was put in prison. And so oh, yeah. because of the circumstances, which I don't go into all of the details about, you know, the activity that was happening and everything, but because of the circumstances, we were left, we had to move out immediately. Okay. So I didn't have, I mean, I wasn't uh, working outside the home at the time. So I didn't have, you know, a job to be able to support us. And so for three months, we were just, you know, when a lot of people think homeless, which I did too, it's like, I'm not literally on the street, but we had no home. So it was just going from friend to friend, you know, some people at church or whatever might, maybe they were on vacation for a week. And so they'd say, you can go ahead and stay in our place, you know, for a week you had that. Back. so we bounced, we just bounced from, from house to house, um, over the course of those three months until I was able to get us into our own place. Right. Right. Okay. So that worked. And you had two children or you had three at the time? Three at the time. Yep. Because I usually had three children. I'm sure. Yeah. So they were, um, when that, I believe it was either, they were either four or five and five and six, my youngest ones. And then my wow. older daughter was 17. Okay. Wow. Okay. Well, at least the older one was 17. I mean, I mean, yes. the other yes. two were still babies. They were still young. Exactly. And that was one of the hardest conversations yeah. I've ever had to have where oh. I had to, you know, sit them down and, and tell them both that, you know, their dad wasn't coming back and they, they, it was like a death, you know, he was there one day, yeah. gone the next, and there was no way that I could really explain it in a way that would, that they could understand at that age. So it was extremely difficult. And we were all in therapy, you know, all four of us, yeah. um, you know, we had, that. Our, how do you explain we, that to your child? 
You exactly. Know? Well, and I, I had to, you know, go through that with the therapist. What is the best way that I can even sort of navigate this? Because they're going to have questions and and there's just no way for me to be able to to explain in terms that they would really understand. But the therapist was saying it's very important with kids that honesty, you know, so um, don't try to give them false hope, you know, because they'll be wanting to hang on to this hope that yeah, where you is know. he What's he coming home? You don't want to say he's coming home in three years or five years. Or they don't have that. Con- they don't. They can't understand that. The years, right? That at that age, it's not like you no, said, definitely you know, whatever, not. You definitely say. not. They can't understand uh, it at the age. Yeah, I mean, the only yeah, the only way that I could really explain it was, you know, some people have certain types of sickness and you know, based on the the sickness that they have, they can make some choices. And I explain consequences, you know, it's like when, when you're a child and you do something that maybe okay, you're told not to do, you know, you have, yeah. you have consequences, you know? Yeah. So I was explaining to them, you know, how, when you do something and you have a consequence, it's the same thing when you get to be an adult. And I explained that, you know, sometimes the consequences get very, very, very big, depending on what has been done. And I said, in, in this case, the consequence was that, you know, he has to live somewhere else and and won't be back, basically. So um, it was very hard because, of course, like, how do you how do you wrap your mind around this has been someone who you've had around, you know, every day for your whole life. And then all of a sudden they're gone and you didn't get a chance to say bye Um, it was was absolutely like I can't even there aren't words to describe the level of heartbreak and um just seeing how they interpreted it and and I'm an extremely sensitive person I have a very badass personality but I I feel things so deeply and it was absolutely heart-wrenching um to have to say those things to have that conversation and I had a lot of anger about it like it's so unfair. It's so unfair that they have to go through this, that I have to go through this, that I am now holding the responsibility of a whole family because of someone else's choices. And, you know, so there definitely were those, those moments of extreme, like frustration, anger, resentment, you know, why me, why did I deserve this? Right. Um, but then you can also just you know, in a crazy way, because I always turn things in my own head around too on situations yeah. like it's probably best he's out of their life now than you know years from now. If this person was indeed, I don't want to know. We, yeah. well, I don't know what's going on. But if indeed it was yeah. something that could trickle into the home life, it's probably best now that you have control of this, right? A little, I think, and you don't have to deal with that. And those children will grow and understand also. Um, what you did for them and how this worked out and you're showing them you're able to show them I think another side that they don't have to be subjected to you know whatever it was being di- or whatever he did you know so and that's them- that's the tricky part too because um you never know how people are going to interpret something you know I didn't know oh. how my kids were going to grow up what they were going to turn out like uh, I mean I still don't know many of those things I feel like we have very close relationships now and I've been very it's important to me to be open um and honest with them but age appropriately you know so that has took on different forms um over the years um so yeah it's tricky because yeah you don't know how they're going to interpret things you don't know I mean I I figured you know they're either going to be they're going to blame me they're going to take their anger out on me and they absolutely have in in different ways at certain moments you know and I, I get it I'm the one that's there I'm the one that has to take the brunt of, of it all. So it, that part is difficult, but, um, as to whether or not, you know, they'll, they'll determine or anybody determines whether something was beneficial for them. There are so many people who I feel like make a mistake that it is always a better thing to have both people in the home. And a lot of women don't make the decision to, you know, uh, leave a toxic, toxic relationship because of the kids. That's to leave the toxic. You know, I'm trying to say some people, like yeah. you just said, they'll think, oh, it's better to have two. It's not. And I'm going to say not it always. There. it's not because what you're doing, you're bringing that toxicity into that home. And sometimes even though it was, it was a short, it was gone. He was gone. It may have been the savior in the end. You understand? Cause you got rid of that. Now you heal and you grow together. Whatever this person did good, bad, I don't know. I don't care. This will be yeah. something that these children, hopefully so I'm not trying to get into your living room, but hopefully they'll be, they'll yeah. understand this. Right. And 
it'll be it'll they'll grow with them better than having yeah, that you know yeah, you, that, you always hope for the best possible outcome yeah. and that's why i do think that it's important to be yeah. honest you know yeah. um and I, I have been very open with them age appropriately, like I said. Uh, so, you know, it, it remains to be seen. I mean, my youngest is 14 and um, my son is almost 16. My oldest is 25. Uh, so you look, you look like you're 25, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I, I was a young mother. So I know, still, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, you remind me of Pink, by the way. Changes up. You, when I saw your picture, when you come over, that we were, we were going to be doing this interview, I'm like, Gosh, it looks just like pink. <laughs> oh, thank you. You know, I used to have platinum blonde hair, so I got that a lot. I, I was just, you must have heard that from others. Yeah. Oh, my God. You could have been like sure. a, a double. <laughs> For sure. I love her. That's such a fun. Oh, it's funny. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll have to see, you know, how it all gets interpreted. But um, I really do think, I mean, my core belief is that regardless of what's happened to you, I really do believe that things can turn out for the best for everybody. And of course, we all have consequences for, you know, the things that that we do. And, you know, I mean, I sometimes we suffer consequences for other people's choices. Uh, and I've just been very open, you know, with my kids about all of this that, um, you know, I, I am not a perfect human by any means, you know, and so if anything, I tell them your mom is imperfect, I make mistakes. And when I do things that I know are like, oh my gosh, I snapped at them or something, I will apologize and say, you know what, I not that it's any excuse. I'm just, you know, having a day. And, you know, I'm sorry. So I, I think it's really important to be you know, to be real, to be, to be human and people hold single parents for whatever reason. I don't know why this is, but they're more harsh for my experience. People are way more harsh on single parents than they are on two parent families. Well, it's, it's, a like stigmatism. Almost... it's a stigmatism. It's a stigmatism. 100%. I will admit that it's definitely you're labeled. Don't know definitely. why myself. I don't know why myself, because if anything, I think, well, I shouldn't say what I think. I just know what I felt because I've been single. I was a single parent as well. I felt mm. like I was more, I was stronger. I was more resilient. I was to me. I was a, more of a whole than some of these other couples that I knew they were two living in a home together. <laughs> That's all. Yes. Right. That's yes. All. I felt For like sure. you know, uh, and I had more stability. I had more, and, and not that I was in other people's houses, but I knew you know, a small town. Was, you kind of knew course. what's going on, right? And I'm like, yeah. I have more stability here for my kid than they do in their home and they got two parents living there. Yeah. What was going Definitely. on? And that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> yeah. So I agree with you yeah. on that. Well and it's also just I feel like people are hypercritical. It's almost like whatever your yeah. kid might do, if there's any sort of like um behavior that's viewed as, you know, maybe not the not the best behavior, it's automatically because they come from a broken home, you know, yeah. and it's like, what about the kids that have two parents and they're still acting out, you know? Well, that's what I'm saying. Or, yeah, well, yeah still, they just assume, like, which I mean, I absolutely did go through, you know, financial destitution, having to sell plasma to get groceries and Christmas gifts and things like that. But it hasn't always been that way. And so people make the assumption if you're a single parent, it's like there's all the pity and, oh my gosh, you must be struggling. And, you know, you that absolutely can be the case, but I've rebuilt my life and I've gotten to the point where I completely changed, you know, my financial situation. And so it's, it's really interesting to me to see that, um, you know, a lot of people during the time that was hardest for me were the most critical of me. Um, and, and it didn't make any sense to me. I didn't understand. It was almost like they were looking at me expecting, you know, uh, me to fail or for the kids, you know, if they had the littlest bit of peanut butter on their or whatever from eating a snack or something, it's like, oh my gosh, somebody called CPS because, you know, her kids yeah. aren't, aren't as clean as they need to be or something. It was ridiculous. Yeah. But anyways, um, I feel like my kids are, I, I, I really feel like they are so well-rounded because of the life experience that we've had. They are so resilient. You know, we've moved <laughs> numerous times during that, that season of, you know, homelessness, we didn't have a place. We were just going bouncing around. I, I definitely framed it as an adventure. So I told the kids, I was like, this is an adventure, you know, we're moving out of this house and, and we're like, where are we going next? You know, what, what is it going to be like? And just being able to have, um, sort of a different identity instead of it being this, of course it was a tragedy, but I was trying to find a way to make the tragedy feel less tragic. Exactly. So we even on their therapy the days, you know, I would always do a little date, even though I didn't have money, you know, it was kind of like a, a little ice cream cone at McDonald's or something like that. You know, I'd take them for a little date on their therapy days. That's so all that they need. Like you know, at that, that age, it's best to do. It's more the quality and how you're spending the time than, you know, the quantity. And 
you know, whatever you, you had it, you, you figured that out. Uh, yeah. How are the kids today? You said that they sound like they're little, young, they're young adults today, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so they're the ages. The age is like, <laughs> how are they doing? All right. They're good. Yeah. I mean, you know, everybody's human. They're everybody has their ups and downs. <laughs> But I mean, and I'm sure every parent, you know, I'm not just saying this because they're my kids and, you know, I'm partial, but my kids are seriously amazing. You know, my oldest daughter, she is so evolved, you know, she has so much life experience and she's such a beautiful soul. You know, she's just really positive and very much um, filters life the exact same way that I do. Nice. Um, my son is, uh, he is so brilliant. Um, he's actually working on developing, uh, his own game right now. Uh, he's very much. Yeah. So he's, he's super, I mean, ridiculously smart and very entrepreneur mindset type. So he wants to have his own business, own his own business, make a life for himself. Sounds good. Uh, very good. And then my youngest daughter, she's, I, it's been super fun to watch her personality blossom. She has a hilarious sense of humor, um, very high level thinker. And she's someone that I used to be a little bit concerned about being growing up to be very insecure. And then something just completely shifted in her where she is her kind of like, OBS. Is she will not let people push her around. She's a very strong, you know, vocal person so they're seriously i mean everybody is human and has their flaws but they are really amazing kids I'm all right very that's a, yeah sounds fantastic yeah well with a strong mom like you her, your daughter's gonna be like her mom yeah <laughs> i mean i want them to be themselves but i mean if they take well, on they need a role model that are something. the good ones <laughs> yeah, they need good. well so you're you're a podcast host as we mentioned earlier um well your children how do you children feel about you being a podcast getting into all this or you didn't tell them? <laughs> um, well, no, I had told them that I started my own podcast, which, like I said, it's very new. And so I haven't really gotten into it a lot. But they do know that I'm doing these, you know, interviews. I'm kind of doing a podcast tour where I'm being featured on a lot of different podcasts to get my story out there. And they're, I think my son is kind of indifferent. It, he's just kind of in his own little world. It's kind of like, okay, cool, you're doing that. Um, both of my daughters are very, very excited because they see so much in me and the value that I can give and offer. And so they're, they're very excited about, yeah, that I'm, I'm featured all these different places. It's yeah, kind it's of, beautiful. it's kind wow. of fun. Yes. So, um, wow. Okay. Very cool. Nice. And, um, let's see your podcast. Um, just trying to read. So what's your podcast? What, what is it about? Are you doing kind of like stories or just, are you going to specialize in one particular item? Really the whole reason why I started it was because so many people were requesting me to, to do things like that, okay. to really start talking about my story. So I initially started it with the intention of just having a platform to share whatever the hell I want to share. You know, it's like yeah, anything yeah, that comes up, whatever I feel inspired to share about the things that I've learned in my life, just have a place to, to share it out, you know, which I, like I said, I do it on social media. I'm also, um, developing my YouTube channel, which is more than likely where I'll spend most of my, um, most well, of YouTube. my face forward time is on my YouTube channel. Um, oh, yeah. but it's just, you know, like I said, it's a, all these different platforms give you access to different communities. And, you know, since people consume information differently and hang out in different spaces, it just gives you numerous connection points. Mm -hmm. I gotcha. Okay, cool. All right. So what advice would you give women that are, that are in situations like what you had? There's what so advice? much I can say about that, but well, for one yeah, thing, we got, we got some time. <laughs> you I mean, me. I feel like the biggest thing, um, is so many women feel stuck, which I felt stuck too. So I get it. And depending on the level of toxicity or abuse that's happening in the relationship, I mean, it can be, you know, I don't, I'm not trying to minimize anybody's experience, but there are extremes where there's very much threats happening, you know, physical threats, um, you know, safety threats, you know, where you're being monitored and, you know, your devices are monitored, your location is monitored. Um, and so there are, there are some women who are on the extreme of fearing for their life. And, you know, that's, that's one side of it. And then there's other people who, you know, have very toxic, unhealthy dynamics where the relationship doesn't feel good. Maybe they're talked down to a lot. And, um, you know, there is a very strong emotional abuse element or what have you. And, and it might just not feel like 
you know, you're not having the physical threats or safety threats. It just doesn't feel good to be in this, in this relationship, but whatever the case is, I would say that every person is, is deserving and worthy of love and to be treated good, you know, to be treated well as a human being. And if you're in a relationship that is, you know, putting you down or that is abusive in, in any of the different ways, there's so many different ways that a relationship can be abusive. And I'm not talking about, uh, you know, the, the very surface level things where, where someone is, um, where it's just not the best fit, you know, cause I feel like sometimes people can exaggerate, um, you know, a relationship just because it's like your personalities just don't mesh that well. That's not what I'm talking about, but whatever the case is, I, I just implore women, please do not stay in these relationships. I know there can be complex dynamics to getting out of a relationship, depending on what's going on with yours, but we oftentimes rationalize, we make justifications, we remember the good times, or we're afraid to be alone, or, you know, there's so many, whatever your, your reason is, I just implore women, please <laughs> don't stay in a toxic relationship. There are ways out. If you're on the extreme end, there's, I mean, girl, I've, I've been through it, you know, like I know what it's like to have to try and make sure that, you know, your, your safety is covered. You know, I feared a murder suicide situation in my case. So I understand wanting to make sure that you and your children are safe and, you know, not even down to the location being anonymous and all those different things. There are support systems in place for that's, those things. And that's very important. What you just said, because yeah. I've, I've speak, spoken to a lot of different women and yep. they all say the same thing they feared their life yeah um, and it's not life. always that extreme but you know there are a lot of people who the, who threaten you know the women that they're not going to be okay they're going to you know hunt them down they're all those things yeah. and and I just always want to say that there are resources in place, you know, women who are afraid of not being able to make it financially, there's resources in place, there's shelter in place, there's all of these things in place. And so it, even though you might feel stuck, even though the threats might feel, and I mean, I don't want to be held accountable for anything that anybody does. I'm, I'm just sharing my own personal story. Well, that's and what, what, we, I that's what this is all about, sharing your own story. And exactly. I just don't want someone believe. to go out there and make a right. decision and say, well, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, we know that. <laughs> I'm no, just we know releasing that. my liability. But I just know that whatever, so however that. <laughs> extreme the situation is, there is a way out. Even if you wouldn't think that there's a way, there is a way out. You and your children can be safe. You you can be provided for. You can get back on your feet again. There are things in place for that. What I will say, though, is that a lot of women, you know, let's say it's whatever the relationship is. Maybe it's not a super toxic relationship. It's kind of like, you know, where there's a lot of threats happening or whatever. It's just a very... Um, you know, it, it's just the kind of relationship that doesn't feel good. So you make the decision and you're going to end the relationship. Um, a lot of women go straight from one to the next. And from what I have experienced and what I have observed, that is never a good, a good idea. And you get to where, when you identify with your relationship and needing to be in a relationship in order to feel good, or because you want the companionship or because you want, you want the financial provision or whatever, it's just never a good idea for the reason I said earlier in this call, because it's like different faces, you know, same story. It's like you're, you're, oh, I know. you're still, I know. you, you really need to allow yourself the space to be by yourself, not in a relationship to give yourself the time and the space to do that internal work, which the internal work is always the hardest thing, but is the only thing that will be able to change your ability to attract a different relationship or a different dynamic in a relationship. You're just going to continue to, to find yourself. I have so many women that, how do I keep attracting these guys? And I'm like, do you actually want to know? Because I can tell you. Well, go ahead. No, yeah, just tell, Cause no, that's seriously. something we talk about all the time. How do you keep attracting these type of guys? Uh, yeah. So let's throw that out there. Tell, tell me what your thought is on that, on what you think it is. And what this is said right. with so much love, so much yeah. love. I am not hating on anybody. This is just what I've learned from my experience and also working with a lot of different women and just understanding yes. these things as I've studied them. We, there are certain personalities and certain types of people that are attracted to women who are insecure, codependent, um, naive, 
um, very trusting, which I'm not saying being trusting is a bad thing, but, you know, women will find themselves, you know, especially, and, and again, I'm not hating here. I'm not hating. Oh, you're a lot not hating. Of women have had bad relationships with their fathers or they've witnessed, you know, unhealthy dynamics in their homes when they were growing up, oftentimes not exclusively, but oftentimes from their fathers. So we grow up with these, you know, kind of skewed ideas of what a relationship should look like. And so it feels so good to us to get into a relationship where we feel like, oh my gosh, you know, this person is showing me attention. They're saying that I'm beautiful. They're, you know, pouring all of this feel good stuff in into my life. Maybe it's financial too. And so it feels really good to be doted on and taken care of and complimented and all of those things. And that's usually the way it starts. And then, you know, slowly you'll start to see that some of these abusive uh, things, components will start to enter the re relationship and oftentimes those happen slowly and you start to get even more beat down and it never started out that way. It was quite the opposite. A lot right. of people have love bombing tactics where it's yeah. like, and that's, we've actually got of... into that, how that we, all, we had a group of us, yeah. we did a lot of group sessions and every woman had come in with a story and that's exactly the, and I'm like, it's typical. It's, and, but you see, at, we, we as women need to understand. I mean, if we're that given person, we're that, and you, like you said before, we can't say, Everybody's going to be that bad. They're not going to, we have to identify these people. And that's where stepping back and knowing who you are before you see, you know who you're getting involved with. We do. We may not yeah. want to admit it, but we do to some degree. <laughs> right? You kind of know a little bit about them. So that's up yeah. to us to say and identify some of these red flags, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and kind of retract a little bit. Oh, God, no, not another one of those. And it's because yeah. of the given personality and because of who we are, we could attract that. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. And one thing that is a little bit interesting to navigate, um, and I'm getting into a little bit of a different topic here, but I feel That's like right. it's it some sort of attention. <laughs> yeah, story time, right? What I also see happen with a lot of women who have been in toxic relationships, and this happens with men too. You know, I have a, a, a guy friend who somehow finds himself with weird, like, you know, women who are just full of drama, mass chaos. And I've made very specific, I, I've pointed out specifically how this is happening and he's very aware of it. And yet it keeps happening. And so this is by no means just a woman thing, but, but one of the things that I've noticed is that there's constant attention on narcissism and sociopathic tendencies and psychotic tendencies constantly. Like if you were to look at this person's feed, it would be all kinds of videos shared about narcissism and all kinds of videos about gaslighting and all kinds of stuff. You know, there's a lot of cynicism and bitterness and all this kind of stuff. And what I will say is that if that is your focus, you cannot attract something different. Mm -hmm. You can't, you won't. Right. Because what, whatever you focus no. on amplifies, it, it puts off it. And this is a attraction weird for some people, <laughs> but it puts off a frequency like yes. tune, tuning into a radio channel. Yeah. You know, if you want to hear certain music, you turn to 93.3. And it's like, if you're tuned to the 93.3, where the psychotic people live and the, and the drama people live and the toxic people live, you can't attract something different if you're focused on that channel. Exactly. So that's one of the things that, that I have. Yeah. yeah. That I have done is that I've been able to maintain a level of detachment where I do not focus on the, I know I'm talking about my experiences and that in and of itself is tricky because I, I, I understand the power of your focus and I don't like focusing on these things because I also don't like to attract these things. And I understand the power of focus. However, I'm not, it's one thing if you're not really impacted, you know, I can talk about these things and I, you can see, I'm not getting like upset or angry or you know i'm not coming on here just that to was bitch your journey. About that was that. Your i'm not just yeah. yeah i'm not complaining i'm not yeah. sitting here you know exactly. i'm doing it from with a different intention with a different energy and that is everything so i don't hold all this cynicism and bitterness you know i see a lot of women who you know they'll they'll join these groups you know, on Facebook and different things, they'll join the groups and, and they'll want to know, you know, was this guy dating someone else? Or it's almost like they're hyper-focused on um, looking for the the red flag, you know? So it's like, I, I need to tune into this. I need to make sure that I'm not attracting someone with the red flag. So it's like, I'm if I go on a date with somebody, I'm going to be looking for all these behaviors that might be toxic behaviors or might be representative of a red flag. If you're doing that, you're going to find, find it. Well, that's seek and you shall find, right? <laughs> I mean, 
You can look, you can look at it and you come up with a reason. Right. It's a huge thing why yeah. women, you know, it's, and that's where I go back to that healing piece because there's, there's a quote, I probably am going to botch this up, but there's a quote that says, don't worry about that. Like, you do well. <laughs> it's like something along the lines of, if you don't heal your wounds from the past, you're going to bleed on people that didn't cut you. And so you have to do this as much for yourself as the person that you're in the relationship with. And as much as you want to blame whoever else as the problem, there are, you know, we all have our own story. We all have our own part to play in it. So if you take radical self-responsibility, that's one thing I had to learn is to take radical self-responsibility where I am now, you know, my past is my past. And from this point forward, I am taking radical responsibility on the direction my life goes. And when you do that, some people, especially if they're, they're in a victim mentality, don't want to hear that because you, you, there's a certain satisfaction that you have when you're in victim mode, whether you're willing to admit it or not, you know, people showing you all kinds of compassion and being, being able to, um, you know, be sort of like treated more specially because you were a victim and all those things. And so it's like, when you're in that personal empowerment mode, then people will hold you accountable and you are holding yourself accountable. And that can be extremely uncomfortable, but in order to change these things, I had to really take that radical responsibility and say, okay, I need to take time apart. I need to take time to myself. I need to take time to do the healing because if you do not do that internal healing and if you're someone who's always blaming the other person, it was their issue, their behavior. Well, there was something about not you heal. Right. that. So whether you want to admit it or not, there's something about you that they were attracted to. And usually there's some wounded part. There's some wounded part that either you're playing that savior complex. You're trying to like help that person and you see their woundedness. I used to call it broken wings, broken wing syndrome. Broken wing thing. And, and it's like there's this yeah. unhealthy yeah. codependency dynamic going on where, you know, maybe they see you as a victim. So they're, they're trying to help you or you see them as a victim. So you're trying to help them. And there's just this very off balance, toxic dynamic happening. And until you do that internal work, um, for yourself, you do that healing, which from my perspective, the best way for that to happen is during that alone time when you're yes. not in a relationship. It, it's not to say that it can't be, it can't happen when you're in a relationship, you need to find yourself. You need to find but it is easier when you're, <laughs> when you're, you know, you have that separation and you don't right. have all those voices like feeding into you. You know why you're focusing on you. We're givers. Yeah. When you're a giver, right? Like when you're given your focus, no matter what, if we're in a relationship, we're given to them. See, when you're, when you isolate, not say isolate yourself, but when you're alone, you're focused. Now you're with your focus on yourself. Yes. So you're pouring all that out into you. And that's why we can grow into even better people than we were, say, you know, into some of these crazy toxic relationships. But uh, Mindy, it was great having you on today. Uh, lot mm -hmm. said you're um, super, super smart. Like I said, I enjoyed talking to you. Uh, you. Love it. But, um, you do have a podcast and I'd love for you to share that with my listeners that they know where to find Mindy Lyons. And so if you could just, what is the name of your podcast? I'll let you tell. It's me. the Mindy show. Um, I might be changing the name, but it's the Mindy show. It's on all the platforms. It's on, you know, YouTube and Spotify and uh, all okay. of that. Um, Mindy is M I N D I. Okay. Well, we're going to take all that information from you. Anyway, so we're going to put that when we post so they can find you. Awesome. Thank you great, so much. I appreciate great talking to you, Mindy, but don't go anywhere because we're going to uh, quick chat you before we head out. <laughs> but thanks again. <laughs> and we will talk to you again soon. Thanks, Mindy. Thank you.